are going to be talking about grasslands of southeast Arizona. And this is, we do a lot of different bird surveys in my uh, job capacity as uh, the coordinator of the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program. This is a program that's co-run by uh, Tucson Audubon and um, Audubon Southwest. Uh, so the office of the National Audubon Society. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the IBA program later specifically, but we do have this pattern of surveys that we do. We're in the summer, we do our trogan surveys um, and our cuckoo surveys. And then in the spring, we do sort of some general migration surveys, but also some Lucy's warblers and focusing on some species like alfalfa and gilded flicker. But our winter surveys are one of my most favorite surveys that we do. It's a really good season for the IBA program. And it is definitely a, um, a season where I have been here the whole time while this protocol has evolved. We have been doing IBA winter grassland surveys since about 2010. The winter of 2010, 2011 is when we started doing these surveys. And I was hired at Tucson Audubon in 2010. So I was around the whole time we were developing this protocol, really struggling with this protocol. And one of the most uh, difficult obstacles we had to overcome was identifying these birds, which is something that we're gonna talk about is how difficult it is to identify grassland bird species and just to get close enough to them to get a good idea on them. So it's been definitely, um, a journey, and we're going to talk about a little bit of that journey, but I want to start with the grasslands themselves and just how significant they are, because I think a lot of people that live um, part of the year or all year in southeast Arizona don't quite realize just how significant and how lucky we are to have these amazing grasslands and just how important they are ecologically on a continental scale and what biological function they serve in the big picture. And it really is very cool and a very significant uh, contribution that these grasslands give. So we'll talk about that in general and then we'll talk about some of the specific grasslands. Okay, so let's see here. I need to share my screen. Hmm. Okay, share screen. Yes, share. All right, so can everybody see that okay, the presentation? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. All right, so Chihuahuan, grassland bird species, and the chestnut colored longspurs. So we're going to be talking about grasslands in general, and then specifically chestnut colored longspurs. And those are the birds you see flying behind me, but also on this big screen right here. This is a really good photo of a flock of longspurs flying uh, through the um, through the La Cienegas near Sonoida, and they're really special grasslands down in the Sonoida area and the San Rafael grasslands area. And I would also like to take a moment to thank our partners. Grasslands are such a big deal that we do have some partners on this project. Uh, Arizona Game and Fish has been funding the Arizona IBA program since the very beginning, like 2005, a long time. They've been a very valued fiscal sponsor through um, the Arizona Bird Conservation Initiative, which is that next logo and moving from right to left. And then we got an additional amount of support to intensify these surveys last winter and this winter, which we're gonna talk about specifically. And that was a grant from the Sonoran Joint Venture, which is a subsidiary of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then we got a, a lot of really good, very concrete advice and help from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. So we're gonna talk about them specifically, but really special thanks to those partners because we couldn't have been doing these more advanced bird surveys without their help. Okay. Go to the next screen. There we go, okay. So let's start big picture here, big picture. So bird conservation has really been in the news a lot the last year. That 3 billion birds report came out, which was a collaboration of Cornell and many other partners where they looked at bird population trends over the last 50 years. It was a 50 year time parameter survey study and if you're not aware of this study, I don't want to put, spend too much time on it, but it's very, very interesting. And if you're not aware of this at all, if you just Google 3 billion birds, you will find a lot of really lovely resources uh, that were written for this study. Cornell did a really good job of trying to present this data both very, very scientifically, but also in a way 
that was going to be understandable by general people because they really wanted this to become a splash in regular media, which did happen. The New York Times ran articles on it. It was a big deal. So the 3 million birds gone since 1970 uh, study made a big splash. And so this is one of the infographics from that. But this is another infographic that gets a little more detailed. This is one that was run by the New York Times where they interpreted data from this huge, very, very thorough kind of groundbreaking study that was done by Cornell, uh, much of which was eBird data, not all, but much. And what this is showing is different uh, habitat types and the declines within those habitat types. Because the 3 billion birds that are essentially missing from the population uh, if you compare populations from 50 years ago to today, was not evenly distributed across habitat type. Grasslands took the biggest hit. So species that are associated with grasslands declined the most. And this is very significant to what we're going to be talking about. So grasslands is this top category. It's sort of a tan right at the top. And it's over 50%. Pop bird population changed since 1970. So that is incredibly high. So they are the fastest declining sort of group of bird species, if you group them by habitat, of any other type in North America. So grassland birds, they did all these great infographics for different categories of birds, um, grassland birds, insect eating birds, all sorts. And it's really very, very cool on their website. But grassland birds, so their estimations from this same study is that three and four Eastern meadowlarks have been lost since 1970, a 53% population loss in grassland birds since 1970, and 72 million grassland birds lost since 1970. So grasslands are really of very high conservation concern for all sorts of bird conservation groups. And a lot of work is being done with these birds right now in terms of tracking them, as well as habitat restoration work is going on. Now, there's a lot of reasons that have been identified for why grassland birds are declining and one of the most significant is habitat loss. So there has been quite a lot of loss of habitat <laughs> from uh, these grassland birds. And a lot of it has to do with agriculture. These lands are incredibly um, fertile for, uh, for agriculture. They don't have to be cleared of trees or anything. It's, it's already a grassland. And historically humans have converted that sort of land into agriculture and has only accelerated in the past few decades. And then another more modern problem that has happened is natural gas extraction, you know, commonly known as fracking, has fragmented and damaged quite a lot of um, grassland habitat, especially in the northern tiers of um, the lower 48 states of the United States up into Canada. So there's been quite a lot of damage to grassland habitat of sheer conversion, but there's also been issues with invasion of non-native grasslands of grass species, which we're gonna talk about later as well. And this has been especially a problem down here in the, the Southwest. So grasslands are in peril. I don't usually do big <laughs> wordy slides like this, but I do think this is pretty significant. And the numbers are really very, are telling a story tremendously. So. Um, there's different types of grassland, different categories of grassland habitats in um, the United States, in North America, and 11% of the tall grass prairie um, and 24% of the mixed grass prairie and 54% of the short grass prairie that once covered much of the continent remains. So that means there's been only, that's the percentages that are left in uh, North America. And there has been uh, quite a lot of degradation too of habitats in terms of things from um, invasives and sometimes invasive encroachment of native trees can be a problem in grassland habitat. And we also have grassland conversion continues at a rate of millions of acres per year. So this talk is gonna, I try not to get too technical, but there's a lot of really interesting technical aspects of grassland conservation. So we are gonna go into that somewhat. But if you really, really want to nerd out on um, these components, I do have some links to share with you guys and we'll paste them into the chat window at the end. I have a little paragraph of links ready to go that, con that connect to some of these reports that I'm referencing here. And then species that migrate from the Great Plains, which chestnut colored longspurs are one of them, from the Great Plains to Mexico's Chihuahuan desert grasslands, which turns out to be most, most of the birds that nest 
in the Great Plains and the, the northern tier of the, of the lower 48 states of the United States down to Mexico and Southeast Arizona's <laughs> Chihuahuan desert grasslands have declined by almost 70% since 1970. So that's a huge decline. And that's from a paper from 2018 from Comer. Now let's talk about the grasslands themselves. This is a really nice map showing the distribution and the different types of grassland that can occur in North America. So we have California grasslands, the basin stuff, and grasslands themselves have a very specific definition. They have to be land that is uh, grass dominated and having less than 10% tree cover, which is really not that common. You know, a lot of people, but it's also more present than uh, folks who live in Tucson or Green Valley or, or may, may realize, because you go to places like Sonoida and places around Sierra Vista and uh, down near, you know, southeast of Patagonia into the San Rafael grasslands. And there are huge spanses of grassland, kind of like what's behind me in my Zoom, uh, my Zoom image here. But it's still more rare um, in terms of on a continental scale. So we have things like the tall grass prairie and the short grass prairie, which is where the, the longspurs tend to breed, mixed prairie, and then down into Chihuahuan desert grassland. And so it's a very specific category, even though we live in the Sonoran Desert in Southeast Arizona with Chihuahuan Desert coming in from the east, like from New Mexico, this whole, all of our grasslands are ecologically known as Chihuahuan Desert grassland. So that can be a little confusing, but if you understand that, I think it really helps when you're reading reports and technical reports about um, grassland bird species is that there is grassland known as Sonoran Desert grassland, but that tends to be little patches of grass that are within actual Sonoran Desert. So native grasses that occur along with saguaros. That's what's known as Sonoran Desert grassland. These grassland expanses that you see in places like Sonoida are Chihuahuan Desert grassland. Okay, so this is a really cool set of maps that I got from that same scientific paper, the Comer paper, and it is showing on the left the historical extent of major grassland types. And then the right hand uh, map is showing sort of the current remaining patches of, <laughs> of major grassland types. And these were, this was done as part of a study to propose uh, grassland areas that should be um, targeted for conservation, because this is what remains of, of healthy grassland habitat. And you can see there's been quite a lot lost. There's these, um, the colors on the right are significantly smaller portion than what's on the left. So there's been quite a lot of um, loss of habitat here. Now this leads to another concept that you hear a lot in very technical bird conservation meetings which is the GPCAs. These are grassland priority conservation areas. And this is a map showing where those occur and they all have a specific name within Chihuahuan desert grassland. So, and you also get a good sense here too of where Chihuahuan desert grassland remains. Right here in the top left of the photo is um, the boundary of Arizona, New Mexico and Mexico. And you can see here there's two grassland uh, priority conservation areas that occur in Arizona. One is known as the Sonoida uh, GPCA, which includes the Sonoida Los Cienegas area, as well as San Rafael is part of that same um, parcel of grassland priority conservation area. And then the Sulphur Springs uh, priority area, which includes the extensive grasslands along the base of the Chiricahua Mountains. So if you've ever driven um, from the south up to the east side of the Chiricahua Mountains, you've driven through extensive grassland habitat. That really does look quite Chihuahuan. It's full of yuccas and it looks pretty darn Chihuahuan. And so that's the Sulphur Springs parcel. And this is from a study that was done by Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, this map. And you can see these little grids is where they did an extensive study, which we're gonna talk about. They've really stepped up to do a big study, but you can see that most of this Chihuahuan uh, grassland occurs in Mexico. And that's actually incredibly significant from a conservation point of view, since the amount of conversion from grassland to agriculture has really stepped up in recent years in Mexico. So this is a great concern to bird conservation biologists and is really where groups like Sonoran Joint Venture become incredibly significant since that is a you know, joint venture, it's a bird conservation um, coalition created by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but it is binational. So the Sonoran Joint Venture does provide grants and funding and conservation work into Mexico. So I know a huge priority for them has been 
these grasslands since so many birds depend on them for their wintering survival, including chestnut colored longspurs. You can really see here the extent of um, how much this occurs in Mexico, but also just how small the patches that remain of viable grassland habitat for, um, for Chihuahuan grassland. So this is the most technical thing I'm gonna show, I promise, but this is a great little set of graphs showing from 1970 to 2010 of specific species, grassland species, the Henslow sparrows have increased, which actually isn't that surprising considering their habitat type has been a target of conservation restoration efforts for the last several decades. But everyone else, <laughs> mountain plovers, uh, now thick-billed longspur, sprags, pipit, baird sparrow, and chestnut colored longspur have declined dramatically in the last, uh, this map's 40 years, but in the last uh, 40 to 50 years. So let's talk about chestnut collared longspurs, the, the, the really long name bird that many people who bird in Southeast Arizona haven't heard of. Now, the nice thing about longspurs is if you're a winter resident of Southeast Arizona or a winter visitor, is that that's actually the best time slash only time <laughs> to see chestnut collared longspurs in this part of the country. So this is what they look like. They're quite a handsome bird. This is a male in his all his beautiful, breeding plumage glory. They're actually gorgeous birds, the male. So they have these lovely black bellies, that chestnut collar, some stripes on the face and some ochre right around the, um, the bill. They're really pretty. I have to admit, I've never seen one looking like this because they do not look like that. And when they are here in the wintering grounds, they look a little bit different. Uh, they look much more drab. And here's the thing. I know sparrows intimidate a lot of birders. I mean, they intimidate me still to an extent. They're very they're hard for them. It's hard to get a good look at them. They're small, they're flighty, they don't really sit still. They tend to mix into flocks and they're just, they're difficult. They all look pretty darn similar. But the thing about chestnut collared longspurs is while they look like sparrows, they are not sparrows at all. And I also wanna take a, a sidebar here. When I say CCLO, I'm sorry, that's a four letter banding code. It's an abbreviation for chestnut collared longspur. So they're not sparrows um, and their behavior tells you that quite a lot, but recent genetic studies have proven that longspurs and snow buntings are only distantly related to the emberzids, which is the, the sparrows family. So they're actually much more closely related to birds like snow buntings. And once you start watching chestnut colored longspurs on their wintering grounds very, very closely, their behavior is pretty darn similar to things like snow buntings. These, mm -hmm. these windy grass expanses, where uh, longspurs like to winter, the way they sort of cling to the ground and avoid the wind. They're really very cool birds and they are in the family of Calceridae, not sparrows. So if you're intimidated by sparrows, <laughs> know that chestnut colored longspurs are not sparrows. But from an identification point of view, they sure look a lot like sparrows and that they are small birds that are mostly brown, at least when they're down here in the winter and the females are mostly brown but know that they're not sparrows. They're, they're little relatives of snow buntings. Very cool birds. Now their breeding grounds, here's a range map on the right from, um, from Cornell. Their breeding ground, which is in orange, is in the top tier. So it's in places like Montana, a little bit into Idaho. The Dakotas is where they mostly breed up into Southern Canada, into these, these grassland areas. The yellow is their migration uh, route. So they do, tend to overwind them, um, they'll stop over on their migration in places like certain grasslands within Colorado are well known for um, you know, the longspurs being there just a few weeks as they're migrating. And then their wintering area is shown quite large here. Now it is mostly in Mexico into Western Arizona, most of New Mexico and into Texas and Oklahoma, which we're gonna talk about is really not, that might be a historical wintering range, but they are not in most of these areas in the Southwest anymore, where they are is quite restricted in their wintering. So they have historically bred at sites that are disturbed by fire, grazed by a diversity of herbivores until the late Pleistocene. These are ancient birds. That's the thing about the Calceridae family is they're, they're very old school birds, kind of an ancient line of birds. And so yeah, living in areas like the late, late Pleistocene after which grazing was primarily by bison. And this is something a lot of studies have found about the breeding grounds of birds like chestnut colored longspurs. So up until very recently, nearly all of the research on these birds was done on their nesting grounds. And 
the presence of grazing animals has turned out to be incredibly significant where plots where they will breed uh, one year that has had grazing happen in the last several years, if grazing doesn't happen periodically, if the grass isn't kept short, and that grazing doesn't have to be cattle, it can be bison, it can be prairie dogs, but something that's keeping the grass shorter is what they definitely need to nest successfully. And that seems to be the sort of habitat cues that speak to them on their wintering grounds too. They tend to be in areas that have had grazing activity in the last several years. So they avoid nesting in areas that have been protected from grazing or other disturbances that maintain short sparse vegetation. So fire, prairie dogs, cattle, bison. And then they winter primarily in the short grass prairie and desert grasslands of the Southern U US and Northern Mexico, also known as Chihuahuan grassland, which is what we've been talking about. Now, I have seen this in real time while doing, while organizing, coordinating, and then participating in bird surveys in Southeast Arizona in the winter. You go to places like Las Cienegas near Sonoida, which we'll look at some pictures of, and you see a lot of grass, um, excuse me, a lot of long spurs wintering there. That area is grazed. There are cattle on that uh, BLM conservation area. You go a little bit south on the other side of the highway to the, um, toward Elgin, to the Audubon Research Ranch, which is great for all sorts of sparrows, all sorts of winter birds, like wintering habitat for birds. You go there and you don't find any long spurs. And that seems to be uh, related to the fact that there is, um, a lot of um, absolute ban banishing of cattle. So cattle haven't grazed on the Audubon Research Ranch in the last 50 years, and there are no long spurs as a consequence. That seems to be directly related, even to the wintering. So let's talk about long spurs. So they have declined by more than 87% since 1966, with an estimated 33% decline within just the span of 2003 to 2015. So one of the most rapidly declining in terms of population species in North America. Every year or so, you'll see sort of a ranking of the fastest declining, most conservation needy birds in uh, North America. Chestnut colored longspurs fluctuate between sort of second to third to fourth place on that list. They're one of the most declining species, one of the highest priority conservation concern species in North America. And Many people don't really know, birders, many birders don't know hardly anything about them. And they're really fascinating, charismatic birds. But when they're here in the wintering grounds, they can be a little under the radar in terms of how they look. So these are some really good photos of chestnut collar long spurs. And you can see they're quite drab. <laughs> they really are sort of grass colored, which really I'm sure pays off in terms of avoiding predators. Um, they have that really cool name too of long spur which you can see how they got that name in this photo. And if you look at other photos of long spurs, you can often see this, or if you see them in person, which we'll talk about, uh, their back toe of their foot has a very, very long um, claw. And that is where they get their name of long spur. And in the breeding plumage have chestnut collards. Now, uh, collars on the males. So this is a great photo of a little group of long spurs taken in Southeast Arizona during one of our surveys. And towards the end of winter, we start getting into uh, February when the birds are getting ready to leave this area and start heading back up to their breeding grounds. Some of the males start coming into their breeding colors. And so sometimes you can see little black bellies coming in on some of the males. So even though most of the winter, um, the males will look a lot like females, look like these sort of um, really warm tan and brown colors. They, uh, towards the end of the winter, they start to come into some really pretty colors. And they have these really interesting tail uh, marker of having mostly white tails with a little black V, like a little black um, sort of arrowhead look on the tail. Field guides talk about that a lot. They talk about it all the time. And we're gonna talk about that too. And honestly, that is not the best way to identify them. Cause you never, you hardly ever get such a good look at them unless you're taking a photos. In the field, you hardly ever get such a good look at them that you can see that. There's some much better clues that happen in the field as to what you're looking at in terms of long spurs. So this is one of my favorite things ever is that eBird has created these lovely movement maps showing migration of various species. You can go onto eBird.org from Cornell and look at many of these maps in real time. So once I click on it, this map is gonna start moving, but what it's showing us is the relative abundance from yellow to purple in terms of you know yellow being 
uh, least abundant to purple being most abundant. And then it's gonna move through time too, January through December, and then as well as location. So it's gonna show us where these birds occur throughout the calendar year. So let me click on this. Uh, yeah. Dang it, why isn't it working? Okay, well, it would show is that they go up into the, the, um, the grasslands up here and then back down. And that they are most abundant. This is showing their wintering habitat as being most abundant here in Southeast Arizona, incredibly dense into a little bit into New Mexico and far more sparse in Texas and Oklahoma. And the, the data peters out down in Mexico, but very extensive in Mexico too. And I have some very detailed maps of that as well. So estimates suggest that uh, species populations declined by more than 87% since the 60s, and that breeding populations in Nebraska and Minnesota have been much reduced, and the species no longer breeds in Kansas, where it was described as abundant in the 1870s. So these birds have really declined, and a 33% decline within 20, 2003 to 2015. And significantly, it was listed as near threatened in 2000, since 2004 by the IUCN, which is the International Union of Conservation of Nature, which is the big red list that biologists use globally to see how birds are doing uh, population-wise. And this year, um, in 2019, it was elevated to vulnerable status. That is impressive, but also shocking. It was elevated in terms of its conservation danger to vulnerable, and the next step up is endangered. So it's definitely a bird that is declining rapidly. Now, this is a lovely um, data representation from Bird Conservation of the Rockies which is doing a tremendous amount of research in, um, in Mexico, as well as Southeast Arizona and New Mexico and into parts of Texas as well. And you can see here, there is quite a lot of wintering population happening in those two grassland segments in Arizona, but most of their occurrence is happening in Mexico. And this is why so many conservation efforts are scrambling now to do really important work in Mexico. So the IBA program, is really helpful in things like this. Since this is an international program, it is headed up by BirdLife International out of the UK. 178 countries participate. There's more than 12,000 IBAs worldwide uh, with only 40% of those having any, sort of, any form of like legal formal protection. It is definitely um, happening on private land and stuff where there are no protections. But it's a really important program because you have, you know, 718 global IBAs within the United States. There's distributed throughout the entire country. And the Arizona IBA program, there's 48 IBAs currently in Arizona, 19 of which are global IBAs. Two of those global IBAs are grassland IBAs that trigger global for chestnut colored longspur. And this is a map showing the different important bird areas within Arizona. And you can see here, they are spread throughout the entire state. They go south to north and east to west. They are pretty well distributed. They are definitely concentrated <laughs> in Southeast Arizona, which is gonna be unsurprising to anyone who's ever birded down here. There's so much good birding down here, including of course, Chihuahuan Desert Grassland, which are two of these IBAs. Let's get a look, take a closer look. The Los Cienegas, National Conservation Area, important bird area, is a global IBA for chestnut colored longspur. It's right near Sonoida. Um, it's a wonderful, beautiful area, very easy to access in terms of just taking the major road from Tucson, uh, you know, the 83 down to Sonoida. You go right by, if not through, parts of Las Cienegas. And it's just lovely grassland with pronghorn and really lovely wintering um, bird birding to be had down there, really nice. But if you go further south, the second IBA is the San Rafael Valley, which is um, near Patagonia. So if you ever make a visit to Patton and you have time, it's worth checking out the, um, the San Rafael Valley. It's absolutely gorgeous. So here's what the San Rafael grasslands look like. It is extensive. It's shocking when you see it. If you've never been there, I really, really suggest you go. And winter is by far the best time. It is mostly private land. There is a state park on the southern end. It's mostly private land, but there are several major public roads that go through the San Rafael that you can bird from the road quite easily and really have a lovely day out there um, in the San Rafael. If you want directions on how to get to the San Rafael, you can go to the Tucson Audubon website, or if you go to the um, Arizona Important Bird Areas website, I have a profile on the San Rafael with directions on how to get there as well. 
and it is full of native grasses. And that is incredibly significant for long spurs. They really depend on native grasses for food. And we have added a component of surveying grasses to our, um, our survey protocol and have, I highly suspect when we started and our first year of surveying bore out that areas that have extensive encroachment of layman's love grass, which is a non-native grass, have fewer long spurs. They really need that, those native grasses to are much more healthful um, food source for them than um, non-native grasses. So the San Rafael is mostly private. It's been grazed for over hundred years and the long spurs love it for the wintering. Las Cienegas is an area that we have surveyed extensively in the last several years and have had uh, great results maps that we've made up about this and have had long spurs throughout the grassland. Now we're gonna look at some actual interactive results at the end, but it's really quite a lovely area. It's, it's public land, it's mostly, mostly public land. It's Bureau of Land Management with some in holdings of private, like the ranch houses throughout the grassland. It does have some problems with invasives. It does have quite a lot of layman's love grass, but it also has large tracts of native grass. And where that happens, you uh, find a lot of long spurs in the winter. And they've also had some problems in Las Cienegas with encroachment of mesquite trees, which are a native plant, but occurring, you know, encroaching into grassland where they don't normally naturally occur. And the BLM has put huge amounts of money and manpower into removing mesquite trees where they're not supposed to be historically. And that has also been a great conservation effort to help birds like chestnut colored longspurs. So just not a bond has been doing winter grassland surveys for a very long time. And uh, as long as I've been here and the first few years we did it, we had a lot of you know, learning on the job, trying to figure out how to, how to find grassland birds, how to effectively survey them, how to, how to identify them, and how to get around in some of these areas. And in the last several years, I feel like we've really turned into a, a really great, um, finely honed winter grassland bird survey machine. I have a, a great team. I have people who have helped nearly every year since the beginning. Uh, I always try to take a group photo. That's what's going on here in the San Rafael in front of Bog Hole. And we've also learned that long spurs are best identified in flight and not looking at field marks in the traditional sense, but more the way they move, which I have a great video to show you later. So their movements and their calls is one of the best ways to identify long spurs when they're on the move. And another thing about chestnut colored long spurs is they love cattle tanks. So Cattle tanks are throughout both Los Angeles and San Rafael, and they're kind of like ponds, ponds that are dug into the ground that collect water, sometimes have a hose putting water into them from a well, but uh, they collect water and it's for the cattle to drink from. And the long spurs love to drink from them as well. And this has been a huge focus of our recent surveys is which tanks they like the most. And here's a group of long spurs coming in to get a drink because when you eat mostly seeds, you need quite a lot of water to digest those seeds. So they really do need to drink several times a day. So that can be one of the best strategies for finding them as a birder is going into really good grassland habitat and hanging out by a cattle tank in the winter time. They'll, they'll show up, they'll be there eventually. So we usually have done, it is a global IBA bird, which is really significant to me as a coordinator of the Important Bird Areas Program, it's, a, it's a, our, one of our highest priority bird survey species. We do two surveys per winter in both Las Cienegas and the San Rafael grasslands using IBA volunteers. I piloted it two winters ago and then did it very seriously this last winter where we added a tank assessment component as well as grassland grass species identification component. So I've really intensified the, um, the seriousness of these surveys and have made them a lot more scientific uh, with the hope of put, adding our data to larger conservation efforts that are happening from really big bird conservation nonprofits and scientific groups, which we'll talk about. We've also added a sound recorder component. So this is a device that you, uh, we, we, have, we own several of them now. They're basically an electron, a big box of electronics with two microphones on the side with a large capacity for batteries. <laughs> he puts in very large batteries in them. And you take this device and you, you, you program it and you leave it out in the wilds, somewhere where you have a focus. And we've used this very successfully for several species. We did it for yellow bill cuckoos, Lucy's warblers, elf owls, and we have started using it for chestnut collar longspurs. Now this is not a device that 
it's very passive. You record it, you, you, excuse me, you program it when to record. So you set it for dates and times. Okay, I want you to record every morning from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then from, you know, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., like that sort of thing. And then you leave it there and it passively just turns on its microphones and just listens to everything, ambient, ambient sounds. So we put these near cattle tanks. So this is a cattle tank in La Cienegas, uh, one that frequently gets long spurs. They really like this tank. And it has to do with, it really seems like it has to do with how gentle these slopes are. They need, they can't have a sharp drop off of a tank, which many tanks have because the cattle can reach the water. But if it has too steep of a cliff, what looks like a cliff to a long spur, then uh, it doesn't seem very usable to them. They like these real shallow almost beaches of, of mud and dirt that they can then walk out onto and get a little drink with their, because they're very small, pretty small birds. So we put sound recorders at these tanks, had them turn on at strategic times. And then these tank, these recorders are then listening. And this works really only with birds that make a lot of sounds on their own. So it's not playing a call or anything to instigate them responding. It is just listening. So long spurs, Luckily for us as surveyors, long spurs make a lot of noise when they're on the wintering grounds. They travel around in these big flocks, like in the photo on my Zoom thing, they, they really do stick together in these groups and they call to each other constantly, especially when they're flying in. So we then use the special software called Kaleidoscope, which then you take all those audio files that you've, and we have SD cards we swap out, you know, once a week in these locations or once every other week. And that's so much audio data. You couldn't listen to it all to try to find out when long spurs are occurring. So we instead use this really advanced, really interesting, very cool software called Kaleidoscope where you train it on the sound you're looking for. And then it then goes through all the audio files and tries to find them for you and turn them into little clips for you. So it's really cool. And so we were able to do this and we're still working on it, but it's very cool, very kind of cutting edge bird survey technology that's worked very well for long spurs. And then we could then take those occurrences and put them into spreadsheets where we were then taking these audio occurrences and getting really interesting, very thorough data on when long spurs were occurring, the exact time and locations where long spur flocks were coming into tanks where audio recorders were placed to get a drink. So it's very interesting, very cool data that would be very difficult to gather with a human team of surveyors. So very, very cool. So I uh, piloted two winters ago and then done very seriously this past winter and then into this current winter for our grant with Sonoran Joint Venture, we have developed a far more intense protocol involving sound recorders, tank assessments, grass species um, assessments, percentage of native and non-natives, traveling transects, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment here, I have an example of that, and adding more formal search area plots. And then as, as well, of course, is putting those sound recorders out. I'm also looking to expand these surveys into the Chiricahua Mountains grassland area, because I'd really like to get some of that data as well. So we're gonna talk about next, a video of long spurs, give you a sense of what to look for in the field, but it'd be very helpful to everybody, to all these bird conservation groups, as well as to Tucson Audubon, if when you encounter chestnut collared long spurs, if you could put those sightings in eBird. Either if you're using a hotspot for your location of where, uh, where you're out birding that day, which is great, eBird suggests that. If you're out you know, birding you know, on Las Cienegas and you use, use a Las Cienegas hotspot, try to put some coordinates information in the, in the um, comment for the chestnut collared long spurs you find, or you could even just start a new list on your, on your app and that will then pin it very close to the location from where you saw the long spurs. Because this data is incredibly helpful and is used by all sorts of studies. And, and I look at it frequently every winter to see where people are seeing long spurs because it does shift around from year to year in our experience. So I'd like to now talk about, we're not at the question stage yet. We, we can be if anyone has a question, but I'm gonna stop sharing screen now. See if I can figure this out. And then we're gonna talk about some of these Oh, actually, I don't want to. I don't want to stop sharing screen. What I want to do is exit PowerPoint. Okay. So this is a current eBird map of where um, they're occurring. But I also just want to talk about uh, a few things here, and one of which is how to identify long spurs. The most helpful way I have ever encountered with long spurs, and I actually got a lot of this information from Homer Hansen, and then my own field experience has really played in as well, 
is the way they move as a flock through the sky and then their sounds. So turn that volume up and I'm gonna turn mine way up. This is a video that Matt Griffiths, a staff member of Tucson Audubon captured uh, during one of our grassland surveys. I have this on YouTube and one of the links I'm gonna share is to this video. So you can watch it, you know, turn the volume way up. Uh, but it's a really cool video and there's a bit of wind sound, but watch for the dots of the long spurs. Cause to me, long spurs always remind me of popcorn and an air popper. They, they sort of tumble over each other. They don't fly like a school of fish, which is more how horn larks fly through the air where they really are very sort of disciplined almost in their flight. Long spurs are just tumbling all over each other, switching spots, they never hit each other, but just moving around in different slots as they fly as a group. And you can really, this video captures it well. So let's watch that again. Hey Jenny, you may not have, you may not have, uh check the box to share sound. So we aren't uh -oh. hearing any sound. But okay, you can you can easily do that by uh, just unsharing for a moment. Okay. And then click share again, and then just hit the little button in the bottom left that says share computer sound. <clears throat> oh, I didn't know that. Thank you, Luke. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's definitely watch it again then. Okay, and so there, you can really hear the little like, dee -dee 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 diddly diddly kind of call. So it's quite a good video showing um, both the way they move in the group. And this is being caused by what you see in the um, in the the photo behind me here. This photo that is both right here on this article as well as the photo behind me. The way this walk, hello and uh, welcome to a short video. Okay, not that. Uh, <laughs> the way um, these birds in this photograph where some of them have their wings all the way out, some of them have them partially in, and some of them have them completely closed where they're doing their sort of decline is what's causing this popcorn popper effect. These birds are moving their wings at different times. I'm sure it's incredibly strategic to stop predators from grabbing them, but it creates this, this almost chaos effect in the sky, which is extremely distinctive once you've seen it a couple of times. And then those calls are also very distinctive. So we will share that, that link to the video um, so you guys can watch it as many times as you like, but it's incredibly helpful. And this photo does also show the, the sort of arrowhead dark mark in the tail, but I've hardly ever seen that in person unless it's in a photo. It, they move so fast, it's hard to see. So this is another link I'm gonna share with you guys. This is a really detailed article um, I wrote for Snow and Joint Venture about you know, the decline of chestnut collar longspurs if you really wanna get some more information about it. This is the other link I'm gonna share of our website, the Arizona Important Bird Areas program website, which has all sorts of details about our new protocol, a video of me talking about the protocol, if you're interested in this protocol. It's been quite extensive, but this also very importantly has links to the winter 2020 survey results. I've been doing this more and more with our bird survey, sharing interactive maps of our results. And this first one is for San Rafael. And you can, you can click through some of these different layers and see what's going on. So I have here our, um, our 2020 results right here, which you can turn on and then you can zoom in and see exactly where we had long spurs. And if you click on each one, these are pinned to the locations as well. You can see the details, uh, less than 10% laymans, love grass, which is the invasive grass, mixed diverse native grasses, uh, surface at water tank. And there was 50 long spurs at this location with the date. So 2-6-2020 and then 170 here, and then 35 here. And I'm gonna keep adding to this map as time goes on and start keeping those results going. And I have here different years. Here's 2018's results, let me turn off 2020. And you can see how different it is. In 2018, the birds were on the north end. Now we searched this whole area every time, uh, every every year, twice a, 
two surveys every winter, but um, you can see how different it was. So there's the results in 2018 and there's the results in 2020 and it's different. They're shifted to the South end. And this happens a lot where they sort of, it doesn't switch every year, but they do switch periodically. They will favor certain parts of the grasslands over others and it's not consistent. It changes year to year. So I have that um, really interesting information here. Now, the other thing we've done, so our protocol over the past many years was to just have these different routes and have teams drive the routes looking for long spurs. Since they do move around quite a lot, they can be a little bit hard to find, but we have now partnered with um, Bird Conservation of the Rockies and have really upped the ante on our protocol. So Bird Conservation of the Rockies has been wonderful in sharing information with us on how we can improve our protocol to make our data um, be a part of their much larger, much more extensive study that is mostly in Mexico. I wanted our data to be something that could be useful to their data set. So they've been great. They've consulted with me, given me all sorts of information, shared their protocol with me. And what I did most significantly was try to incorporate their main protocol. Uh, they do these really extensive search plots that take a biologist pretty much all morning to do. And these are huge. They're one kilometer by one kilometer plots that are placed in some of the finest Chihuahuan grassland left in the world. So there were some plots in Southeast Arizona and mostly into Mexico though, where they do um, three transects through these plots. And these are 100 meter segments that then, so they do eight segments of hundred meters. So it's an 800 meter walking transect. They switch data sheets between each segment and then they do a point count. So it's a transect is you're walking a straight line and recording all your birds. A point count is where you're stopping at a location and for a fixed amount of time, only recording the birds from that one location. So they're incorporating both. And our crew couldn't do this, but I, what I did work out with them was that we were going to instead incorporate part of their protocol and make it so our data went in as, as supplemental data. So this is a beautiful protocol they developed, but too extensive for what we're doing. So what we did instead was we developed um, transects that are placed here along the survey routes that are 100 meters long. They're oriented east-west exactly, just like the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies protocol. And they then end in a point count, just like theirs do as well. So rather than you know, the eight segments of 100 meters repeated three times through a, um, through a search area, we're doing one 100 meter segment ending in a point count. So then our data can be uh, incorporated into their data set as extra data. And then also our survey locations are repeatable. So these routes will be done every winter into the future so that we have in the future can start doing some statistical analysis on our data. So we've really upped our own protocol quite a lot and um, have added a grassland component where I want people to identify grasslands, grasses where they find long spurs. So we have this little guide we made. We have native grasses and very significantly the layman's love grass, which I'm very interested in knowing where it occurs in reference to where long spurs occur since it is a non-native and studies have found that while native birds will eat layman's love seed grasses, it's similar to celery in that, you know, that they say about celery, it takes more calories to eat it than you get from it. Layman's love grass is like that for, for native birds. They, they, they will eat it, it's their last choice. They will eat it, they can eat it, but they spend more energy picking up the seeds, finding them and eating them than they get nutritional value from the grass. So it is definitely a net negative for them. And native grasses is where it's at for them. Things like grandmas, muleys, that's what they really like. So we have a, a guide for that. And we have a whole new protocol that we, uh, rolled out this last winter and it went really well. And we have added all sorts of protocols in terms of doing those, those transect segments, doing tank assessments. I want people to review tanks for me and, and classify them. And then we sort of then use that information to correlate from where the long spurs occur. So it's been quite a journey doing grassland um, bird surveys but it's been really rewarding and really great. And we have really intensified the protocol. And I have been so proud of the crew, the volunteer uh, bird survey crew that has really stepped up to this challenge of identifying grasses, which is the thing that seems to freak people out the most and me, it's very difficult. It can be very difficult and really 
doing very well, rolling with the punches on me throwing a lot more advanced protocol at them than we had ever done in the past and doing really a terrific job with it. So I do have some links I wanna share with everybody. Can we stop sharing? Um, I have them saved here on a sticky note, grab them all. So this is, these are really, if you're interested, um, this is a set of links that um, really show both the vid. So the YouTube one is the video, that Matt's video of the, the long spurs. The first two are reports, a really fascinating report from National Audubon Society about grasslands. And then um, our Arizona Important Bird Areas page. And then um, that really great protocol from Bird Conservation of the Rockies, along with a report they did on um, a restoration plan, a conservation plan for Chihuahuan Desert Grassland. Bird Conservation of the Rockies has done so much fascinating work with these birds that I have been so inspired by them meeting them at bird conservation meetings that that's how we made that connection. And then they've been so great in sort of mentoring our much smaller program on how to do more advanced bird science work with long spurs. And we also do keep track of all the birds we see during these surveys, but it's the long spurs are our main focus since they're so declining. So let's see here. Um, all right, so that is the end of my presentation. Let's see if anyone has questions. Thanks, Jenny. Ahead, yeah, we, we do have a, a few questions and start with the previous ones first here. Um, so there's a state natural area in San Rafael Valley. Uh, yes. San Rafael State Natural Area. Do you know anything about that? I don't think it's open right now, but someone had a question about it. That is a really good question. So um, we have had state park employees often help with the San Rafael survey because that natural area is down there and they can count it as work time going to survey down there having a fun day with us. But I do know quite a lot about it from them. It was a private ranch um, like, like all the rest of San Rafael Valley and rather the family that owned it rather than sell it to land developers who wanted to turn it into housing, they took a lower bid from the state of Arizona to sell it to them to keep the valley intact and to preserve the, the habitat down there. It is currently not open to the public. I think there are plans to eventually make it open to the public. However, there's nothing stopping you from going in there. <laughs> you, can, you can go in there sort of not unofficially, but you're officially not supposed to be in there. And the biggest problem seems to be just that it hasn't been cleared for public safety reasons. In terms of there's an old ranch house there, they haven't done the protocols the state usually does yet to make it safe for visitors. So. And interestingly, that is the area too where they filmed the movie Oklahoma. Just saying. So that's also what I know about the state natural area. Uh, Brett, Brett has a really good question right here. Uh, how much cooperation do you get from ranchers and do they implement procedures to help or uh, help the birds or minimize the harm? Any incentives for them to support the work that we're doing? That's a really good question. So it's all been very positive for us uh, doing these bird surveys. So working and there are two main areas, the Las Cienegas, which is mostly public land. Uh, BLM has been a great partner. They often send their biologists with us to help with the survey. Um, so they've been excellent partners and they do do all sorts of active restoration to try to improve that habitat for all grassland species. They do reintroductions of prairie dogs and they do all sorts of really active conservation work to try to control invasives. Um, so they've been great. San Rafael, which is mostly private, has also been very good. They, those ranchers in general, make most of the area available to recreators, to, to birders, uh, to people who just want to sightsee, because it is gorgeous down there. So they keep those roads open. Uh, we've had a few issues of that we were able to smooth over of asking permission to enter some of these private lands. And the San Rafael has a conservation plan that they follow um, and has had input from federal agencies so the San Rafael actively, that coalition of private landowners along with the state, nat state natural area do quite a lot to try to keep that area healthy. And honestly, their grassland habitat is the finest I've seen anywhere in Arizona. So good habitat doesn't only occur on federal or government lands, that private land is amazingly well-maintained, very responsibly grazed and almost all native grass. So, and they do have a conservation plan as well that they implement on a private level. So that's a really good question. That's a really good question. And we have had really good cooperation on both of those surveys. A few questions about where they're being seen or historically being seen. So um, 
Michelle asks, where are long spurs being seen right now this month in, in November? So that's um, a good question. Yeah. That's a really good question. And I've been interested to mm -hmm. see, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, I've been interested to see that they're actually not being seen <laughs> as much as they usually are by now. Um, so this is an, a, a live eBird map. And the red, of course, are sightings from the last 30 days. So they're being seen east of the of portal in that grassland area that's uh, really nice east right on the Arizona New Mexico border. Now I don't know how much of that is Quetzal related people driving in <laughs> to see the Quetzal and reporting seeing long spurs on the way. Um, and that does is something you always want to keep in mind with eBird is sightings happen where people go. Um, they have been reported in the McNeil area they've been reported so far this winter near Sierra Vista no sightings yet in Los Cienegas and hardly any sightings in San Rafael. I'm going down to San Rafael this Saturday to look for them, uh, not in a survey capacity, but in a scouting capacity. They've also been seen in Buenos Aires, it looks like. So historically, the closest areas near Tucson and Green Valley to see them are the Los Cienegas grassland and San Rafael, which is why we survey there. But I have a theory that they're gonna be kind of thin on the ground this year in many of these areas due to our underwhelming monsoon, which is when these grasses grow and that their seed load is created for the winter birds to eat. It happens all very much summer tide, summer rains, moisture tide. Um, but it looks like they're being seen on the, the grassland area east of the Chiricahuas is where they're being seen right now. So I would recommend checking this map maybe next week if you're if you want to know where to go look for them because um, I think a lot more birders are going to be starting their their winter winter grassland scouting right about this weekend. Yeah, I just went and looked at that as well, and uh, specifically went to the San Rafael Grasslands hotspot to see how many people had entered in sightings. And not very many people had, but I did notice that um, a couple who are pretty really good birders, they were out there for an hour and a half and saw a total of 22 individual birds. Now, that's not 22 species, that's 22 birds, um, including 14 horn larks. Yeah, <laughs> so, wow. and only two sparrows one vesper and one grasshopper so that's i don't know if that bodes well or not but no, uh, i'm I mean, actually going to be out uh, there on saturday too <laughs> yes i hope i'll run into you now i did stop in las cienegas mid-october because the long spurs often start coming back around mid-october i did check las cienegas in mid-october on my way back from patagonia and i was shocked at how dry and how dry the area looked and how few birds there were in general and even things just like horned larks so there's very few around and i think the lack of summer rain is going to have a huge impact on the bird distribution this winter and i wouldn't be surprised i'll love a lot of these migrants because they're coming from so far that's nothing these are long distance migrants they're coming all the way from the you know u.s canada border all the way down to the u.s mexico border essentially and i'm sure a lot of them might look around and be like what the heck and then just keep going into those mexico Chihuahuan grassland areas if they had more rain, which checking monsoonal maps, it looks like they did have more rain down there. So I think they're going to go where the food is. So we'll see how that shapes up this winter. Uh, someone had a question about whether long spurs are ever seen in the San Bernardino Valley. I don't know if they go get over to California or not, do you know? Um, well, San Bernardino is near Slaughter Ranch, right? So, oh, it's, oh, San Bernardino, I have to see in California. Yeah. So I <laughs> yeah, have right. looked for them in that area before right. and not found them. They are hardly ever reported in um, Ebert, but they, they are sometimes seen there. I think it seems it's quite periodic. They have been reported more in the Buenos Aires area, but still in really small numbers. So six and two are these flocks. Um, yeah, they definitely tend to stick most to Los Cienegas, San Rafael, and then the Chiricahua Mountains and the Huachuca Mountains grasslands as well. But they were historically in these areas. So Buenos Aires, San Bernardino had long spur reports from the 80s in their uh, historical bird survey data. But I think habitat degradation in recent decades has caused them to be in these areas less. Now, Buenos Aires is about to, it has been undergoing a lot of habitat restoration for the mass bobwhite, which could well lead to improved habitat for birds like longspurs. So I wouldn't be surprised if they start 
coming back to these areas that have restoration efforts happening. But um, historically, that's not where I would go as a birder if you want to find them. They can be there, but it's, it's pretty sporadic. So Michelle's also asking if, if we're doing surveys this winter for long spurs and how uh, they might be able to participate if there's a way to do that this year. Yes, we are going to be doing it. Um, we're taking extra safety protocols and um, doing much smaller teams than normal and not really pairing people together that aren't already within the same household. So it's going to be tricky, but we are going to do it. We were able to make it work for the Trogans this past summer. And we are gonna definitely do these surveys for this winter. I think it's gonna be more difficult, but I will be announcing those dates and the, the, the sort of safety measures we're taking very, very soon. Just watch the weekly email to see uh, when those opportunities are available. But also it is incredibly helpful for anybody to go into these areas where we survey like San Rafael and Las Cienegas and do uh, just go birding, look for long spurs. And if you find them to, to do a really detailed, very location specific eBird list is incredibly helpful for, for our conservation efforts. But yes, we will be doing organized surveys and I will be announcing that very soon through through the main, the normal Tucson Audubon channels. Awesome. Cool, I think that's all of our questions unless someone has another question they, they'd like to ask. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to or raise your hand. And all right, looking good. See the cancel. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, thank you, folks. It was really great to be talking with you about this today. One of my favorite favorite uh, um, subjects. Oh, I see a quick question at the end. Plans to use video recorders. I have tried putting uh, wildlife cameras, the ones that trigger with, with movement. I've tried putting those with the sound recorders to try to get photos that correspond to the sound recordings we're getting. So far, I've gotten a lot of pictures of cows, a lot of pictures of grass moving, um, ducks swimming <laughs> trigger it. The long spurs seem too small, <laughs> too small to trigger the cameras we have. So I am looking into getting some more expensive cameras to see if that works. But um, I have not been able to figure that out quite yet. Video recorders. We're working on it though. How, how can I get a hold of the uh, the uh, links again? Oh, okay. I did put them in the chat. Um, Luke, can we put what these I'll in the do email, is yeah. So I've saved all those links, and I'm going to send out a. Uh, a recap of the presentation later this afternoon along with the link to the recording and I'll include each one of those that that Jenny provided for us in that email. Thank you. You should get that this afternoon. Great. Hey, thanks Jenny. Thank uh, really you. appreciate you joining all of that us today good. and uh, thanks to all of you for for being part of this and you know many of you also donated and were generous as he signed up for this talk. So yeah, big thanks to, to you for that. Um, it's great to be part of an organization where we're all working together and accomplishing cool things like uh, habitat restoration for long spurs and checking to see how, how things are going with, uh, with our birds. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Take care.